This is Senior Pastor Larry McCord, pastor of New Birth Christian Ministries Incorporated, located on Long Island, New York, reaching out to you wherever you may hear the sound of my voice, sending out the Word of God. I know many of you are troubled today, but you don't need to be afraid because you're God's property. And he said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. This is taken from Isaiah 54, verse 17. The only thing you can rely on is the word of God. Tune in and listen to New Birth Christian Ministries on YouTube channel. I look forward to seeing you. Greetings in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. But truly, He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paying attention. I remember when they told you in school you need to pay attention. You'd be surprised what you learn if you just pay attention. Because many people live in this world, but they don't pay attention. Before I begin my sermon, I would like to have a short prayer. Father God, we come before you this morning with these lips of clay. Lord, we ask that you diminish me, but increase you. We ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. And that Lord, we may speak a word, Lord, from you today so that somebody who heard a story a time or two will get a better and different understanding than they had before. All these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. The title of my sermon today is, it's time to move out from your comfort zone. Interestingly enough, we as people get comfortable. And when I say we get comfortable, meaning God may have a plan for you and a place for you, and you on the way there, if you can remember how planes sometimes do a layover or a stopover, you say, oh, I like this place right here. I think I'm going to stay right here. I'm going to cancel my ticket. Or in the case of the covered wagons, they were headed to California, but they got to some place and they saw a little water and a little palm tree and they decided that that's where they're going to stay. So many times God has a plan and man decides, he got an idea. And we wonder why we wind, in trouble, wind up in trouble. Because we think our ideas are equal to God's idea. We think the revelation we got is equivalent to his revelation. And I don't mean the revelation in the back of the book. I meant when he says something, it ain't the same as when we say something. We're going to look at Exodus 1. Uh, verses 5 to 11 right now. Follow along with me. This is Exodus NIV version, Old Testament. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. 
But when the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful, they multiplied so greatly, increasing in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Just remember, we're in another person's country. Verse 8, the new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Verse 9, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Them, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they're going to join our enemies and fight against us and then leave our country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. Forced labor means you, you don't tell the boss you ain't work. You got to work. And they built Pitom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Now, if we look at that, in my lesson today, I hope to teach you three points. When you watch the story, especially when we watched it at the play, they told us where they were and they told us the conditions, but they left out one crucial thing. How did I get here? If you've ever visited anybody in prison, almost everybody in prison tells you they're innocent. I ain't met too many people in all the years I've been practicing law that said I did it. Everybody say they framed me. I was with the guy I had nothing to do. So if you think about the, the Hebrews, they're over in this land. And what did they do? They just multiplied and just ha was happy-go-lucky. They got themselves over there. And the persons who landed was was watching. Now, you know when I know they didn't know that they was watching them like that. Because when they got too many of them, they said, oh, we in trouble. We got to do something about this. You see, if they were paying attention, they would realize, I'm a guest over here. I better not eat too much food or take up too much space, but they didn't do that. The first question I have is, how did they get themselves in that predicament? Many times God people go astray. Now when we saw the play, you know they didn't tell us that. Am I wrong? Did they say how they got there? Oh, we over here and they beating us for no reason. That's exactly what the story got told the way they told it. And just to make sure you get it right, I ain't got but one black character. And guess who he's going to be? The one beating on paper. He the bad guy. I know that didn't escape Associate Pastor Russell. You got, what's that called when you got different kind of people? Uh, there's a name for that. Diversity. But the, the, the whooping part gonna be on you. <laughs> and, and, and the poor little me is gonna be the Hebrew. You know, fortunately it was entertaining. Many times God people go astray. They lose their way. In the story we call Pharaoh and the children of Israel, the children of Israel made their way to Egypt because of a famine in their land. They had no food. After many years, they multiplied and became so numerous that Pharaoh decided, hmm, I need to handle y'all. And so what did he do? He decided to kill the firstborn of every Hebrew. Although Jacob and his family chose to go to Egypt, they wound up slaves. They chose to go to Egypt. They wound up slaves. 
They chose to go to Egypt. They wound up slaves. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with that picture? Nowhere did I hear anybody say they consulted the priests. They got on their knees and they fasted and they made a decision that I need to go over here to this other man's land and eat up all his food and multiply so that there's more meat in there than him. Think of when you have somebody come visit you for a week and they stay for two months. That's what happened. Now, somebody might say, well, wait a minute, you're taking this a whole nother way. No, I'm telling the truth. You went to these people's land and you, you, you just took over. And they said, oh, this is dangerous. I can't put myself in a situation like this. Because the firstborn of Israel was going to be killed. The mother of Moses decided to try to save her son. There's a picture of Moses being put in a basket on the Nile River. Now I'm gonna tell you something. We know she was led by God. How do you know that? You didn't read it, did you? But how do we know she was led by God? Got a crocodile. Got all kinds of poisonous snakes. Got fast curl. And if you put that baby in that basket and God don't have him in his hand, he's going to be out there and the water going to, or the crocodile will eat him. And you know she didn't want to send him away. But the spirit told her what to do. And the same spirit protected the child and drove him right up to Pharaoh's house. I got a question. Do you think when Pharaoh's daughter found him, she automatically thought this is an Egyptian? No. And what tells us that she, she knew who he was? He was wrapped in a Hebrew cloth. And what was the second thing she did after she fished him out of the water? Threw the evidence away. Because she said, if my brother and them other people see him, they're going to kill him. Do you see how God, when he works a plan, how he works a plan? But when man works a plan, you don't know what's going to happen. Well, we do now. They're killing all your babies. They're enslaving you. Because you lean to your own understanding. Now, I got a question. Do you think anything changed in 2000 years that man still leads to his own understanding? He leads to his own understanding. The Bible says, love thy neighbor. What happens if you decide to come here, what is it, about 70 years ago and you was Italian, did they let you in? You immigrated, right? How about if you're Irish? Did you let you in? How about if you're coming from Mexico now? Are they going to let you in? No. So love thy neighbor. We forgot about that, didn't we? See my point? We say there's too many now, but it, but but if you're from Ukraine, we'll let you right in. How do I know? Because I watch TV. So somebody is making decisions and they're not making the decisions based on the Good Samaritan rule, are they? Let us look at the scripture, Exodus 2, 5 to 10. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. I want to call your attention to something. Remember, she has to put that child in the water because she don't know what's going to happen to him. She's just being obedient. Precisely when Pharaoh's daughter is down there taking a bath. 
Now we know she don't know what time the woman take a bath because she ain't down there no idea. But who does know everything since I look and look? And so God has up put the child in because I don't know if you remember this. They hid that child for quite a long time. And because little children make noise, I'm sure there came a time when she wasn't going to be able to hide him no more. So she put him in the basket. Pharaoh's daughter sent her slave to get him. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrews' babies, she said. Then his sister, his sister, Moses' his sister, look where she got put, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go get somebody to nurse the baby for you? Now, Pharaoh's daughter didn't have no baby, so she wouldn't have no milk. So she said, that's a good idea. And who does she get but the baby mom? Now, if you didn't read this, if this was a fiction, you say, wait a minute, that's too many coincidences, isn't it? But is it too many for God? Is it too hard to God for God to work that out? When they're trying to kill you, he puts you exactly under the hand of protection of the killer. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Can you imagine that? You're feeding your own kid and you're getting paid for it. That's favor. That's favor. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. He was raised in the house of Pharaoh by Pharaoh's daughter. That means he had the best of everything. Do you see how God can take you down low and raise you up high? You notice it didn't happen to everybody, did it? What lesson should this teach us? It didn't happen to everybody, did it? But it happened to Moses, didn't it? You see, because God has a job for each and every one of us. Some people are supposed to pray. When you call them up and they say, I'm too busy, God writes that down. You was too busy. Somebody might say, well, how you know? <laughs> Trust me, I know. Take my word for it. Because see, when he loves us and we don't do exactly what he say, he take us to the woodshed. And somebody might say, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. The Hebrews went over there on their own, didn't they? They were living all good when they, uh, Joseph was alive, right? And then Joseph died. And Joseph's king died. And the next king didn't know them from Adam, from a can of paint. Why did that happen? Why didn't the hand of protection of God stay on them? He came first. He didn't, they didn't ask him nothing. But when we do stuff and we don't ask God, he look just like Denzel. I think I'm going to marry him. I think I'm going to date him. I think I'm going to. We don't ask God nothing. And when he do you dirty, who you going to call? You need to call Ghostbusters because you didn't ask God. You didn't ask God nothing. So why are you, why are you complaining when you get a bad outcome? Because you know more than God knows. Somebody might say, well, I ain't never heard it preached like that. Let me put it to you this way. The Bible is not written like a history book, even though some of us want to believe that. The Bible is an instruction manual. If you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. If you lead yourself, you're going to lead yourself wrong. Because you don't know all there is to know. You don't know tomorrow, last week, next year, and in the future. You're only going by what you can see. Because if you're going by what you know, you don't know nothing. Like sheep. 
and we in the pasture. And when we see a pretty little old flower outside the pasture and go out there saying, oh, I'm going to bite that piece of beautiful fruit. We go out there and guess who's there? The wolf. But we, had we walked over to the shepherd and went like this, the shepherd would grab that hook and say, uh-uh, don't go out there. There's danger out there. And God gives us shepherds because he knows we will lead ourselves astray. That's what you should have got out of the first part of this lesson. Number two, point two, how would they get out? They're in a mess. How would they get out? I don't know if anybody considered this, but you know there was more than a million Hebrews out there, and they had leaders. Not it. Why like wasn't their leaders leading them anywhere? It's time to move outside your comfort zone. Watch this. I don't know if you ever heard this before, but think about it. You go to your leader and say, hey, listen, they whipped me today. So we need to leave. The leader said, well, let me see. Pharaoh's giving us food. Well, I ain't got the supply. Pharaoh's giving us food. Pharaoh's giving us a roof over our head. And Pharaoh's giving us clothes. Be quiet. You just got whipped today. Be good tomorrow. Why did they stay there? Because Pharaoh was supplying their needs. So who was their God? Thank you. Because if Pharaoh wasn't your God, shouldn't you have packed your bags? When Pharaoh sleeps, shouldn't you have snuck off in the night? You see what I'm talking about. How would they get out? God always has a plan. In other words, not sometimes. Always has a plan. He and he always has a way out. Now watch something. Some of us would have said, well, now, why didn't God send a king from the next town? You know, with some chariots and some horses and some soldiers. He sent Moses. And what did Moses do? Moses killed one man and ran away for 40 years. Now, what we should be saying is, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Maybe God made a mistake. Maybe he chose the wrong guy. Moses ran away for 40 years. Moses was 80 years old when the bush lit up in front of him out there in the desert. But I got a question for you. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Let's look at Isaiah 41 and 10. That's slide 16. Okay. Isaiah 41 and 10. NIV, Old Testament. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right. Why do you think that's important? Watch this. Somebody said, wait a minute. How come God didn't sing a king with some, with some soldiers and some chariots and some horses and some spearmen? He sent one man. You God, you control everything. You sent one man. So unless they decided that it was the kings and the chariots and the horses that saved them. That's true. They could have said that. But watch something. There's a common theme, and most people miss it. Do you think God knows who to choose to do the job? Do you think God needs to send 10 men if one man will do it? Did y'all hear me? You see, in our minds, we need all these people to get the job done. Against you. Because you got God, you don't need nobody but the one. And if you don't remember this, I'm going to recall it to your memory. David was one of eight brothers, and he was the least of the, of the eight. He wasn't in the army and he had never battled a man. 
Who did God send to fight the most fearless warrior of the most fearless bunch of people, army there was? One person. And he didn't even give him a sword. Now you think if he needed a sword, he'd have gave him one? So he had a sword. It was called the sword of God. Amen. And whatever you bring to the fight, when God sends you, it's what you need. So when I say, do you know who you are? Now this is going to sound drastic to you. But did the Hebrews, when they were in Egypt land, own their land? When they were in Egypt land, did they own the Egyptians' land? No, it wasn't. Could they build a temple over there without Pharaoh's okay? So they're living under, beneath their privileges, right? They left their land to go over here because they ain't had no food, and they stayed there after their land had food. Comfort zone. Pharaoh giving me a food and a place to live, I'm going to live beneath my privileges. When I say, do you know who you are? If you don't have anything for yourself, you know, like most of us want a nice car, a nice home, and a few dollars in the bank in case we have to buy some food, because the price of inflation, everything's costing more. So you don't need, you need a, a few dollars. Okay, if you know who you are, do you have to go beg and break? If you know whose you are, do you have to beg break? Isaiah 41, do not fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed that things are high, because the God I serve, he said, if it's high, I'm going to give you the increase. Do you know who you are? Look at your neighbor and say, do you know who you are? Okay, we're going back to Moses. Give me slide 17, please. Okay, there is Pharaoh's, one of Pharaoh's taskmasters, whipping a slave. No, I got that wrong. There's a the slave over there. There's Moses going off on that taskmaster. And he killed him. Now, you know that was straight up murder. You, you realize what Mer Moses is doing, right? He ain't doing what God sent him to do. God said, lead the people out. He's beating up on people. Do you start to see how even those that he chooses sometimes take matters in their own hands? Now, once he did that, we know from the play that Pharaoh said, you just murdered somebody. I got to kill you now. And what did he do? He ran away. Why did he run away? He didn't have a conversation with God. God didn't send him there for that. Because God could have killed everybody with a word. So when he's doing that, he's out of order. I want you to say you can run, but you can't hide. Let's say this. You can run, but you can't hide. You do realize Moses ran away at 40. He stayed gone until he was 80. Most of us would say, what you going to do at 80 years old? <laughs> that job ought to have been given out to somebody else by now, right? Did God give away that job? He left that job right there for Moses, didn't he? Hmm. While in the wilderness, God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. Let me see my slide where the burning bush is. Now, when he, Moses saw this bush burning, you know what he said? He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That bush is burning, but it ain't burning up. So he goes a little closer. And when he gets a little closer, a voice says, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. That would, that would stop me right there. Like, what? <laughs> the bush is talking? Why is the bush talking to Moses? Because God has a second message for Moses. You see, we know he heard the first message, but he, he wasn't obedient. How do we know he wasn't obedient? Because he ran away. Can we remember in the Bible other people who God gave jobs to and they ran away? Jonah? Yeah, yes. 
what is the common theme that God gives us stuff to do and we don't want to do? We run away. We don't want to do it. And in a way, back in them days, they thought that was the easy way. You can't find me, God. I'm going to run away. Think about it. God can't find you. You see, in your mind, he can't find you. But he's looking at you all the while. Now, he comes to Moses in a burning bush. And he says to Moses, Moses, I need you to go back to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. I'm glad I wasn't waiting on a sandwich and Moses had to come back because 40 years, I would have stopped to death. But God got patience. God got patience. Moses returns to Pharaoh. Let me see photo three of the slaves. Now, Moses goes to Pharaoh and you see Pharaoh got these people working, right? You know he don't have no workers comp, you know that, right? He don't have no workers comp. He don't pay no overtime. He don't have a medical plan. And you asking him to let his free workers go free. It took me a while and a minute to get you under my thumb. Am I about to let you go? So Pharaoh looks at Moses like, well, where's your army, buddy? I don't see no army with you. I know you grew up with me, but you ain't got no army. I do have. I don't think you're going to get no loose slaves. And, and Moses stuck that little stick in the water, did he? Bam. And one of Pharaoh's men say, all the water can't be drunk. It's all red and got blood in it. Now notice something. Pharaoh didn't ask no more questions about where his army was, did he? And he didn't let the slaves go. Long story short, we know that he had eight more plagues and he still was talking trash. But all Pharaoh's food, in case you missed it, the locusts ate up all his food. So now he was in the shape that the Hebrews was in when they came there. So he was still being stubborn. And what did Moses say? Pharaoh, if you don't let God's people go, all the firstborn children of Egypt are going to die. Pharaoh said, oh God, don't you see them statues of me? Don't you see all these people that's working for me? I say jump, they say ha ha ha. God can't do nothing to me. And he went there. You see, Moses at that point knew who he was. He was the right hand of God. Now, the average person would say, I don't understand this. This wasn't Jesus. How he, how he become the right hand of God? You notice how we want to put God in a box? I got to be careful when I'm being recorded. You know how some people don't know who you are? But God had something for you to do. And people, just like in, in Moses' case, they were going to kill him. And his mama put him in the Nile, which didn't look like it had made sense. And he lands up on Pharaoh's doorstep. And Pharaoh raises him. And so he knows everything Pharaoh knows. Know everything Pharaoh knows, he knows. But he knows one thing that Pharaoh don't know, that God don't play with you. And so he said, to Pharaoh, you're going to have all the firstborn of Israel. So the Hebrews come and say what? We're born from here too. You're going to kill us too. What should we do? What should we do? Now, why didn't they have to get on their knees? And why did they run to Moses? They ran to Moses. Oh, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? They didn't get on their knees and go into deep prayer. They ran to Moses. Oh, oh, oh. They was paying attention. The reason they go to Moses is because they have seen what God has, what power God has bestowed in Moses. They've seen the, the locusts. They've seen the other nine plagues. And they therefore realize that if Moses says all the firstborn of, of, Egypt, uh, of Egypt is going to die, that means they're subject to death. And so Moses told them to sacrifice the lamb. And that if they painted their doorposts, 
the plague would pass over them. We know they celebrate Passover to this day. The problem that people have is if God has ever blessed you, we don't spend enough time remembering what he's done. Because if you remember what he's done, you know that if he's done it before, he can do it again. After the 10 plagues, Moses led the Israelis out of Israel. I should say out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, where they got the 10 commandments and they spent 40 years in the desert, Moses eventually died at the age of 120. But the people did get into the promised land. They got into the promised land. We know they got themselves into a mess, but the devil forgot that they were blessed. The devil, Pharaoh, and the taskmasters all tried to do them in. You see, one of the things we need to remember is this. It has nothing to do with how many people is trying to get us if we keep our hand in God's hand. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, when something's wrong, I'm gonna go with the church, and when something's wrong, I'm gonna pray. But think about that for a second. No, you're not. Because when things are good, you need to be giving him the praise. He's God all by himself. God doesn't exist to, to suit us. We exist to please him. When you are not letting God lead you, you're leading yourself. Now, why is it so difficult to understand that? When God is not leading you, you're leading yourself. We already know how that works. Think about it. I'm going to give you a, a modern day scenario. There was a man who was a leader of a great country. They had all kinds of stuff. And he had a conversation with himself and say, I think I'm going to go over here and attack my neighbor. He gonna, I'm going to probably whip him in a week. Last time I looked, that great country is losing. All the world banks have shut down their money supply. They run around here confiscating everything they got that ain't nailed down. I think he didn't think about what really could happen. Because for some reason, when people get a title, they think they know everything. Why did God choose a baby? <laughs> Because he knew he didn't know everything. Am I right? You notice how he didn't choose a grown man with an army? Remember how you said that? Because he said, oh, I'm going to just ride in here and I'm going to attack Pharaoh with the left flank and the right flank and this and that. Ooh, that sounds like what Putin said. How did that work for him? It didn't. Because every nation almost in the whole world, except for maybe China, is on the side of Ukraine. Did he calculate that thing? No, he didn't. Why? Because he let it sell. And it's going to turn out bad. Because somebody over there, I pray. How do I know? You know how many people are helping him? The United States is taking all kinds of billions of dollars out of their pocket. Now, you know we don't do that too often. What you must realize is this. If it seemed that they never were going to be free, but God raised up a champion in Moses. They called out to God to set them free. And God sent Moses, who was only a child, to free the captives. I came here to tell you that God is choosing you for a job. Now, you don't need to tell Pharaoh nothing because he already been told what he needed to be told. But God has given each and every one of us a job. Sometimes when you do your job, and I don't know if you realize this, many times when Moses told these people stuff, they didn't like the answer. One of the things they said, I'll never forget, is after they were free and on the other side of the land, on the other side of the water, 
they didn't find no stream and they say moses moses we're gonna die of thirst you brought us out here with the die moses we ain't got no food moses you done brought us out here to die god just open up the whole ocean and let you go through it and you wondering about oh, you didn't get your lunch and god made manna didn't so why is it when God gives you something hard to do, you question it. Is every job going to be easy? Now, let's be realistic. Moses had a lot of people following him. How many of them were listening? Do you remember when he went up on the mountain to talk to God? Mm -hmm. And he, he left Aaron in charge? Yes, none of them listened. And he came back and they had a new God. They made it up there. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't get confused by how many people you got. Are they listening? Because God only needed one man to listen. His name was Moses, right? And he did everything he had to do. So what conclusion do we come to? When God takes his time doing something, we often want to say he forgot us, but I believe that he's an on-time God. And if we remember that, there's an old spiritual that says he's an on-time God. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him, but he's always right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Oh, he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. Job said, he may not come when you want him, but he's there right on time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. Father God, we come before you today asking you to let somebody know that no matter what they're going through, that you, if they pledge to serve you, you will protect them from hurt, harm, and danger. We hope somebody got something from this because the Bible is not written as a history book, as most people think it is. It's an instruction manual. And if we read it and heed it, not only will we have life and have it more abundantly, we will have eternal life. Amen. This is Pastor Larry McCord. Thank you for attending our services here at Newburgh. We appreciate your contribution and support. Please visit us here in person as well as on Zoom. May the blessings of the Lord go with you and go in peace.